with our live streaming, but we, it's up, it's up. The live streaming is up, so welcome to our guests who are watching from, from afar. Uh, generally, we have many more people watching from afar than we do here, so uh, this is a program that really has attracted a lot of attention. My name is Michael Matera. I'm the director of the Americas program here at CSIS. Um, our program promotes discussion and debate about the strategic agenda uh, for U.S. relations with the countries of the Western Hemisphere. One of the most critical issues today is that of immigration policy and the degree to which the United States will be welcoming or not of new immigrants uh, into our country. Uh, temporary protective status is one of the programs that was established a number of years ago uh, as a part of our complex Immigration and Nationality Act. Other issues that have attracted significant attention, in particular recently, are uh, DACA, the Dreamers Act, and, and more recently, the issue of family separation, that uh, we're all aware of what, what happened on that yesterday. Um, today, we're offering our platform to discuss the TPS program. Um, this will be an opportunity for us to hear from, from the two ambassadors of uh, the ambassador of El Salvador and the ambassador of Honduras about the consequences of ending TPS in their countries. Um, moderating and, and presenting uh, will be Mark Schneider. Uh, Mark is a senior advisor at CSIS, and there are few people in this town who know more about Central America than Mark. Mark began his career as a Peace Corps volunteer in El Salvador a few years ago. Uh, he ended up as the executive director of the Peace Corps for a number of years uh, during the Clinton administration. He's been assistant administrator for Latin America at USAID for six years, uh, and he's held many other positions in the U.S. government uh, and in the international organizations over these years. We're honored to have him as part of our team here at CSIS. Um, a couple of quick announcements um, on security. We're required to announce, uh, to give you instructions. Uh, I am the security officer. If there is an emergency, which we don't anticipate, follow me. Um, and the only other issue uh, today, uh, because of the fact that we have uh, live streaming and, and television here, uh, we'd like to ask that any questions be put on these cards, and if you can pass them up to me at the front. Um, and I, I will pass them to Mark, uh, who will, who will uh, organize them. Um, so without further ado, uh, Mark Schneider. Thank you, Michael. Um, I should note at the outset that we're extremely pleased that El Salvador's ambassador to the United States, uh, Claudia Conjura Centeno, and Honduran ambassador to the United States, Marlon Ramses Tabra Munoz, are here with us today to discuss the implications in their countries of the recent decision by the Secretary of Homeland Security and the Trump administration to terminate temporary protected status for their citizens living in the United States. As you know from the original invitation, the ambassador from Haiti had intended to be here, but something came up and he was unab is unable to be with us today. Now, as the, I think I have it here, test. Ah, yeah, okay. As this slide indicates, El Salvador, <coughs> Honduras and Haiti represent nearly 90% of 437,000 foreign nationals from 10 countries with TPS as of last October. 262,000 Salvadorans, 86,000 Haitians and uh, Hondurans, and 58,557 Haitians. Those individuals live in 200,000 family households, and they have as the following slide, this gives you just Salvador, Haiti, and Honduras, and it indicates when the expiration date is of TPS now, and also the, the numbers. But this slide also indicates the number of children, the second from the bottom, the number of children of those TPS recipients within the 200,000 family households. 273,000 total U.S. citizen children, 192,700 in Salvadoran families, 53,500 in Honduran families, and 27,000 in Haitian families. We've all seen, and Michael noted, how appalled most observers have been to the families of migrants separated forcefully on the southwest border with their children taken away. If T that was 2,300 children that we know of. If TPS is not reversed by the administration or by Congress, 
what happens to those U.S. citizen children when their parents are deported? That's a moral and legal question that has yet to be addressed. TPS, re TPS recipients register with the U.S. government every 18 months. They list where they live, where they work, and are law-abiding residents of their communities. They pay taxes, contribute to Social Security, and follow the law. In fact, if they did not, they would not have been able to maintain their status over the course of the time that they have been TPS recipients, which in the case of Salvadorans and Hondurans is just about 20 years. The 1990 Immigration Act's Title III was family unity and temporary protected status. Authorized the Attorney General then, and now the Secretary of Homeland Security, to designate temporary protected status for individuals in the U.S. from countries where armed conflict existed, where natural disasters like hurricanes and earthquakes had struck, and where governments could not handle their return. Where those governments requested that TPS be granted, or where those individuals could not be returned in safety. And I want to stress that. It was actually a provision in legislation introduced by Senator Ted Kennedy, agreed to by Republicans and Democrats alike, signed by President George Bush in the aftermath of the Central American conflicts, and has been in law ever since. El Salvador was actually granted TPS in the, the law itself at the time. Later, Salvador was designated for TPS in the aftermath of two earthquakes in 2001 by the Bush administration. Honduras, TPS was authorized after Hurricane Mitch, where some 7,000 were killed along with the destruction of 70% of its bridges, roads, and other infrastructure. In the case of Haiti, TPS was authorized after the massive earthquake of 2010 leveled its capital and caused the death of more than 200,000. I actually was in those countries at those times and saw the devastation. Once TPS is designated, it can be terminated only if after review it is found that living conditions are no longer disrupted, that the foreign state is able to handle adequately TPS returnees, and if there no longer exist, I'm quoting, no longer exist extraordinary and temporary conditions in the foreign state to prevent aliens who are nationals in the state from returning in safety, unquote. Even if other conditions are met, if those nationals cannot return in safety, TPS termination should not take place. Every 18 months since their designation, Presidents Bush and Obama and their four secretaries of state and the, their legal advisors and the former secretaries of Homeland Security and their respective national security councils have found in the case of El Salvador and Honduras. 13 times for El Salvador, 14 times for Honduras, that conditions on the ground required the extension of TPS. In the case of Haiti, four extensions were granted. The most recent in each case was 2016. Yet the current administration, and the reason we're here today, has reversed those judgments, stating that the original conditions had changed and that the three governments could handle the deportation of 400,000 TPS recipients and their children, and they could be returned in safety despite assertions to the contrary by the countries and by most experts. Again, the law on, T on terminating TPS requires a specific judgment be made that all TPS nationals could return in safety. Now, we've just learned via a memo of, by Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff and a report in the Washington Post of a letter to the White House and the GAO from Senator Robert Menendez that the U.S. ambassadors in all three countries recently sent cables to the State Department stating that the conditions on the ground did not justify terminating TPS. Despite the efforts by the countries to remedy those conditions, the fact is that in Honduras and El Salvador, homicide rates are still very high, even though they've been reduced recently. Now, how else do we know that security remains a question such that that condition in the law cannot be met? These are the travel advisories issued this year by the State Department. I'll read the one on Haiti, which basically says that travel should be reconsidered, 
because of crime and civil unrest. Violent crimes such as armed robbery is common. Local police may lack the resources to respond effectively to serious criminal incidents <clears throat> or emergencies. Protests, tire burning, and road blockages are frequent and often spontaneous. Similarly, for El Salvador, they issued a, set, a similar one for Honduras as well. Again, this is the provision of law. The Attorney General, now the Secretary of Homeland Security, finds that there exist extraordinary circumstances that prevent aliens who are nationals of the state from returning to the, to the state in safety. If that cannot be found, then TPS should not be terminated. So what happens then to the 273,000 U.S. citizen children of those families in the event that TPS is in fact expires and those family parents are deported. Remember, those children essentially know only life in the United States, various ages since 1999 and 2001. Their parents really are presented with a series of Sophie's choices. Either keep the family united and take those children back to the countries, or if what we heard from the State Department advisories and from the ambassadors in the countries, where their lives would be at risk from Mars and other violence. A second option is to accept the parents, accept deportation and separate the families, leaving their children behind with relatives, with foster parents, or has been occurring along the southwest border with what are called adult sponsors selected by the government social service agencies. There's a third choice that two ambassadors recently, Ambassador John, Neal, uh, John Feely um, and James Neelan, James was the former ambassador in Honduras, also served the DHS until the Honduran term, TPS was terminated a few months ago. They said, what also could happen is that these families may simply choose to go into the shadows and hide, essentially to become illegal, placing themselves at legal and physical risk. And as I, if you may have seen on the, the, um, the text, there's only one exception to the prohibition of terminating TPS if safety cannot be guaranteed. And that is if allowing them to, re, quote, to remain temporarily in the United States is contrary to the national interest of the United States. That finding is not included in any of the DHS justifications for terminating TPS as reported in the Federal Register. And let me tell you why. Why their stay in the United States is not contrary to the United States national interest. First, according to a variety of studies, about 80 to 88 percent of them are in the labor force their departure would reduce U.S. GDP by $4.5 billion a year. That's $45 billion over 10 years. Second, the actual costs to round them up, process them, and deport them are estimated at $3 billion additional costs to the United States. And for businesses, there are turnover costs. These people leave, you have to find new employees and hire them. That's an additional $950 million, which explains why it's in the United States' interest for them to stay. And remember, they pay into Social Security and Medicare. Over 10 years, their departure would result in a $6.9 billion reduction in contributions. And finally, U.S. policy, as many of you know, under President Obama and a Republican Congress, recognized that it's the U.S. national security interest to assist the Northern Triangle countries in strengthening their economies, their democratic institutions, and law enforcement, thus reducing the push factors of illegal migration. That policy has been continued to a large extent under the current administration, although Congress did have to reject the Trump administration budget proposals to cut funding by some 34 percent. But clearly, sending back hundreds of thousands of people to those countries when the governments themselves have said they cannot handle it, cannot be justified. It's even more apparent when the U.S. diplomats on the ground have said doing so would endanger the fragile economies in those countries, 
overwhelm their ability to provide services and protection, and likely prompt new flows of migrants to our borders. To me, what is really contrary to the U.S. national interest and to our values are the decisions to terminate TPS, to fail to protect dreamers, and to separate children from their families. Thank you very much. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all the ambassador to the United States from El Salvador, Dr. Claudia Yvette Conjure de Centeno. She's a doctor in medicine, graduated from the medical school of University of El Salvador, and has a master's degree in public health from the Central American University, Jose Simeon Cañas. She's extensive experience in public health and in working in the Preventive Medicine Department of the Salvadoran Social Security Institute. In the 2009, she joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and was appointed to the, be ambassador to the Republic of Guatemala, a position that she held until October 2012. Subsequently, she was appointed as ambassador to the Russian Federation and in 2015, appointed ambassador to the United States of America. I'm also now going to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Marlon Tabor Munoz. He's the ambassador of Honduras to the United States, appointed by President Juan Orlando Hernandez in, uh, in January 2017. Prior to becoming ambassador, Mr. Tabor served as, amb as executive director for Central America and Belize at the Inter-American Development Bank. He was president of the Central Bank of Honduras and chaired President Hernandez's Economic Council. He also was country representative for Honduras to the IDB. Previously, he was president of the National Telecommunications Commission, and he holds a variety of uh, distinguished educational uh, degrees, including um, masters in international business, masters in public policy management from Georgetown, um, as well as a PhD in administrative science from the Catholic University of Honduras, and a variety of postgraduate studies at Harvard and Oxford University. It gives me great pleasure in turning over the, the mic to Ambassador Kendrick. So, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank Mark and uh, Michael and all the, the team for CS. I yes to organ have su such important initiative to get along together and discuss about this important issue. Even if the, the panel is just about the consequences of the termination of the TPS, I would like to uh, uh, give you some remarks of the job that we as the government of El Salvador have been doing during uh, all these months since November in 2016 uh, when we understood that the, the migration policies and the conditions uh, uh, of the administration are going to to change, so we just began uh, to develop a strategy, an integral and comprehensive strategy, at the state level, at the federal, at the federal level, at the state level, and on, at the local level. We try to involve and to just create a, and strengthen our relationships with uh, stakeholders, organizations, uh, churches, the academics, whatever uh, people that uh, just uh, get and work together and live with our community. Because even though that we have the better relationships with the government of the United States and obviously with the Congress that uh, where is the place that the legislation can be taken? We just understood the, the concept that the most important issue was to 
demonstrate and to highlight all the contributions that our people do to this country. So we were just telling them one by one and trying to educate in them for all the contributions that our people, TPS, give to this country. They work here. They are, the majority of them, uh, we think that maybe more than 90% of them are in the workforce. They are taxpayers at all levels because they pay taxes uh, at the federal level in the states where they live. They are consumers. They are the, uh, the f more than 50% of them are home owners. So they have mortgages. They are, they are linked with uh, the economic uh, development of this, of this country, too. Obviously, besides that, we were trying also to educate uh, all the people when uh, which we meet that uh, for a, the United States, it would be difficult to uh, try to, to uh, to don't have our people in in the development in the economic development in the society because the contributions that our people gives in important work as for example a construction a, a restaurants a healthcare is really very uh, important and we have been meeting with them and the important companies tell us what would be the significance for them uh, to don't have our people among the, the workforce. So, for example, we were, uh, we are partners with uh, Miller & Long. It's an important construction company. And they tell us, I really don't know what I'm going to do on September 2019, when I just find out that uh, one, 100 and some of my workers are undocumented. I will do anything to help and to support our, our workforce, our workers, to get a, a legislative solution to fix this issue. As you know, we have developed uh, a work with the Congress, and up to this moment, we have found that there are five uh, legislative proposals that have been introduced. Uh, obviously, we need more support for that. But besides that, we have been also working with our consulate uh, network, trying to uh, help uh, our people and to give them the advisory so that they can integrate in a legal uh, fashion to the uh, uh, migratory, uh, in a legal, regular migratory conditions. But uh, in the other hand, uh, just talking about the consequences, uh, as you understand, none of, of our countries is really capable to, to receive 190,000 uh, people that return to, to our country. We think that in the case that some of our people return to our country, it would uh, put a, a really stress in our economy, in our society, because they would need some services, some uh, security, some conditions that we are, even that we are making sustainable efforts to work uh, with, his, with it, uh, we are not totally prepared to receive all this amount uh, of, of our connationals. So uh, I think that in, the, in this uh, period, the countries like Mine, uh, we will 
we are developing the, the plan for the alliance and all the programs that are among those plans are giving the better results. As uh, you know, El Salvador has the plan, uh, it, among the plan for the alliance, the plan El Salvador Seguro. And that plan has made the better results. And for example, uh, I can tell you that we have a, give the, the, the results that our homicides has are 50 percent or more lower than in other uh, moments. For example, as I can tell you, in 2016, we had a rate of homicides of 24 homicides per day. Up to this moment, even if it's not a, a good uh, explanation or a good statement, but we have eight homicides per day. We would, our decide is that th this doesn't happen, but this can show you the reality of our country and obviously all the efforts that the government of El Salvador and all its institution has been made in to try to develop better conditions in our country so that our people can return in and get a better conditions. Besides that, we are also working in the prosperity issues. We are trying to, to develop economic programs. Uh, as you know, our country also have the For Millennio, the MCC Compact. Uh, and we have been making a good job with the United States and other countries that are also our friends, trying to develop better conditions. And we have working with them in projects of economic energy, connectivity, uh, developing our seas, uh, our tourism, whatever a uh, project that we can develop to get the benefit for our, for our populations. So I think that uh, in, the, in the case that our people return, we have a, a national plan that is called El Salvador es tu casa. The plan is also developed among the plan for the alliance and the plan just seeks to contribute to the reintegration of our people and we're giving them a training and to certificate all the knowledge that they get when they came to the United States. A, and maybe they can give them better opportunities to, to be there and to insert a, in our society. But our fear is something that I sh we share with, uh, that we have been telling, is that that migration who return, our TPS people who return, as they are high skilled people because they have been working here for 20 years or, or more and they speak English, they are, they are prepared and, and, and coach and train in many uh, specific uh, fields, uh, can just displace other population of our country. And maybe we can create another flows of migration. And, our, and we are really committed to uh, decrease the, the irregular migration. As you know, we have uh, uh, given also the results among the, the, the plan that day by day, the our people who arrive to the southern border are, are less. The unit family, the un unaccompanied children, are very suffer uh, a downward in, in this issue. We know that our people just always try to, to come for whatever reason, for uh, especially in terms of the reunification of, of the families. Maybe they have, they have some relative here who is inviting them to come, so the, our people take the decisions to come. But even though we think that 
uh, all the job that our government is doing in our country are just uh, helping and it's just supporting the issue that uh, many uh, less people is deciding to come in a regular fashion to the United States. So besides that, and just to finish, uh, I would like to say that we just expressed the, our concern uh, to the government of the Salvador uh, for the separation of children to the to the parents or to the the relative. We just uh, heard yesterday. We just knew that the president of the United States signed uh, a new executive order that will will allow the 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 parents uh, to remain uh, jointly with the children. But we really think that it's not the, the end of the issue. We have a, a good relationship with the, with the government of the United States. Our, I think that our partnership also has to be shown at that level. We think that we are going to talk with them about this issue. We are committed to protect and to defend our children. We, are, we will always uh, be there to protect uh, them, their families. The, the familiar integ uh, integrity is very uh, key for us. So uh, maybe in the questions we could answer some about these issues, but thank you very much for your attention. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to Mark and CSIS for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here sharing the, the podium with my colleague from El Salvador. Um, my comments uh, will go in line with the comments of uh, Ambassador Conjura about the, the situation of, of the TPS. Um, we believe that uh, it is important to realize that uh, this is a structural problem. It's, it's probably uh, the TPS was created as a temporary uh, mechanism to protect, in the case of my country, the people that suffer the Hurricane Mitch. But after two decades, it is impossible to think that uh, the TPS is a temporary status. Regardless of, of the situation or regardless of the, of the, the reasons why the, the program stay for, for so long time. And um, obviously, uh, as Ambassador Kanhura mentioned, thinking about receiving, in the case of El Salvador, almost 200,000 people, in our case, more than 50,000 people, it is, it's, I have to be very honest. We have been very honest since the very beginning. We as a country, I think it's the same story with El Salvador and any other country, we are not prepared to receive immediately the, the, these people. And that's the reason why we believe that addressing the roots of the problem is, in our opinion, perhaps the most important uh, action that we have to work. But it's not only the responsibility of our countries. I have to be very honest on that. And uh, during the last two weeks, uh, we had two visits to uh, President Hernandez and the First Lady to, to Washington to talk at different levels, uh, at the highest level. Uh, we were very fortunate yesterday that we were at the White House just before uh, President Trump signed the, the the resolution to, to prevent the, the families to be people. separated at, at the border. However, uh, we also believe that this is a temporary solution. We have to work uh, at the Congress. I'm happy to see Brandon here. Uh, we have been talking for a long time, uh, trying to uh, find out the best way to, to have a more comprehensive solution for, for the TPS, but not only for the TPS, but in general for 
all the immigration issues. Um, another important point that I want like to underline this morning is regarding that uh, we need to create uh, prosperity in our country. I think it's the same story with El Salvador. We have no policy to promote um, irregular immigration to U.S. It is important you to be aware of that situation. Uh, however, uh, we need to work uh, on the field to create more and better opportunities for our people to stay in, in our countries. And um, that's the, that was the idea of the Alliance for Prosperity, unfortunately. Uh, the Alliance for Prosperity has goes too slow, and the results uh, are not uh, what we all uh, were supposed to to achieve with with this alliance. Uh, yesterday, we had the opportunity to talk with Vice President Pence about the importance to relaunch the alliance and trying to focus to address the, the issues. One important component of, of the alliance is uh, fighting. Uh, the violence in, in our country. Um, we have been working as, as, a, as a Honduras, we have been working very hard in, in that direction. In 2011, 2011, 2012, Honduras was the most dangerous country in the world. Now uh, the, the murders are, have significantly reduced, however, still so high, more than close to 40 per 100,000 uh, people. That is, is, is high for, for, nice. for our society. And uh, we need to, to continue working in that direction. So uh, having a, a strong partnership, uh, sharing information with the, with the US government in, in, in general, with uh, some security agencies. We had the opportunity to talk with the DEA, with the FBI, the CIA, because we, we need to, to, to strengthen the, the relationship and trying to fight together uh, because this is one of the most important uh, causes of, of, of the irregular immigration. The other one is, is trying to, to, to create jobs. Uh, thinking about uh, receiving, not only in our case, 57,000 people, but the family as, as a whole, it, it is impossible to provide. We are struggling, trying to create more jobs every day, and receiving this, this amount of people uh, immediately is, is, is not a, a, a good idea for, for anybody. Um, from the economic point of view, in the case of, uh, in the case of, of Honduras, remittances in general uh, made up approximately 20% of GDP, 19, it depends. Uh, of, of the, but I had the privilege to, to be the head of the central bank, and, and for us, remittances is a, an important component of, of, the, of the economy. So uh, even though in the case of the uh, TPS beneficiaries, it's only a, approximately 5% of, of the remittances, but still, in general, I think it's, it is important to to consider that uh, this is an, another important factor that we will affect um, our society in the case of these persons uh, return to the to the to the country. And uh, lastly, because I think uh, probably uh, addressing some of the questions <laughs> will be very uh, um, more uh, useful uh, idea. Uh, When, even though we used to talk about the TPS just in terms of numbers, most of the time, we cannot forget that we are talking about people, human beings. And that's extremely important. It's not only the numbers. Obviously, for policy purposes, numbers are extremely important. But in the end, we are talking about people. We're talking about Life. about kids, most of them U.S. citizens. So that's the reason why we have been talking at different levels, and we will continue doing this the same for the next uh, 18 months uh, together, because it's important to, to work together. Uh, 
trying to find out the best solution. We understand uh, that the domestic policy and the domestic politics in the United States is complicated, especially because um, there is an election on, on November. But uh, we believe that we need to continue working in that direction. That's the reason why uh, President Hernandez, the First Lady, and my team, but also my colleagues from other TPA beneficiaries, are working very hard trying to find out uh, the, the best solution possible in, in this context. Um, if not, I have to be very honest. Uh, I have been talking with the community. I think it's the same story with uh, um, Ambassador Kahura. Most of them will stay here in a different status, probably illegal. That's a reality, and that's the reason why we need to find out um, a more comprehensive solution for, for these people. This is a good people, have been here for almost two decades. They have uh, businesses, they have kids, they have properties, they have access in general. So uh, we need to address the issue from a um, more comprehensive uh, approach. So one more time, uh, Mark, thank you very much. I'm here to answer any questions. Great. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. <coughs> do, you have, do you have any questions that we already people have written? Pass, pass the questions that you have up to this gentleman in the front row. <laughs> and while you're doing that, let me ask one question um, in terms of the, the timing. Is there, has there been any discussion of the possibility um, of reversing that decision given your clear statement that it would negatively impact the economy in your countries and also obviously place additional burdens uh, to, uh, on the public security uh, in your country? I, I really think that we have to understand something. I think that the security and the prosperity in our region is also related to the security and the prosperity for the United States. So I really think that working on this issue is on both interest. So I know that even uh, as my colleague expressed, we have been working in the, uh, at all levels with all the, the people that we can in our communities uh, 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 have been involved in those issues also. But I think that we have to continue this work. So that's why uh, we want to thank you and the, to, to your team and the CSIS for having this initiative. And especially for me, I want to thank the opportunity that you've given us to present the perspective of our neighbor, of our, our brothers. You know, Honduras and El Salvador, we are just close. We share important challenges. And I think that we have the, the political decision as country to work together and to try to find out uh, solutions for the, the claims of our people. And among that, we are working for the TPS people. And in the case that they just reintegrate to our societies, they get a opportunity so that they can remain there in a dignified um, way. Um, two things. Uh, we will continue being neighbors, regardless of everything. We are there. <laughs> so. Uh, and that's the reason why we believe that we need to continue working on that. It's a shared responsibility, probably differentiated, but uh, it's the only way how we can address the issue from uh, a structural perspective, and that's extremely important in, in this context. Uh, It is important to understand to the United States 
in general as a country, regardless of the political party or who is in charge of the administration or that, for example, in the case of building the wall, uh, this is, for example, the main reason why the irregular immigration has increased during the last three or four months. Because the human traffickers, unfortunately, have taken advantage of that situation to promote, uh, to uh, say to the people, you know, this is the right moment to go. You have to do it now. If not, after it will be more difficult for you. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see the, the numbers, how uh, the people, unfortunately, because of the lack of opportunity in our, in our country, because of the lack of security in our country, they decided to, to take this uh, awful journey, uh, especially for the kids and the girls, uh, and, and, and trying to, to cross the border. And, and that's very unfortunate for, for us. I think uh, we need to address uh, one more time the issue from a more comprehensive uh, perspective. Because if not, the issue will be there, <coughs> regardless of, of the action that was signed by, by the president yesterday. I think uh, uh, we need to continue working in a more comprehensive approach. Uh, we believe that <coughs> even though uh, the Congress and, and the Senate has um, um, appropriate resources to, for the Alliance for Prosperity, we need to work, uh, for example, with the USAID. And we need, for example, trying to, to create cam campaigns to prevent at the local level in, in our countries, to prevent irregular immigration, to explain the implications for the people to, to make the decision to take uh, this journey. So I think it's important to, to understand uh, the situation from, from that perspective. Great. Uh, I'm going to go through these questions. Uh, the first one for both of you, really, is that and it relates to the question of security. It says, but, but it relates to in terms of the individuals who are going back. Mm -hmm. In other words, would mass removals of both of the families of the parents and the children, particularly if they're teenagers, I would add, um, reverse the progress that's being made against the gangs mm -hmm. in your countries? Uh, In the case of that our people will be forced to return, I think is the first we have the constitutional obligation to receive our people, and we will do it. So uh, it is important that all the Hondurans be aware that we will receive them. But the problem is not to receive them. The problem is how to integrate the people that is returning to our society, not only to our economy, to our society. Um, I have been living here for almost nine years for different reasons. And I have a daughter of uh, 11 years old. And for her, for her her house is United States. Even though she was born in, in Honduras, we used to go very often to Honduras, but it's difficult. And the most difficult part is when she has to interact with the people in Honduras. So can you imagine people that were born here that they don't speak Spanish, they don't know, they know nothing about El Salvador or Honduras or mm -hmm. Haiti. So it's difficult. So um, we are working. Uh, we have a uh, similar uh, plans as, as El Salvador has, but it's difficult. It's difficult. It, it won't be easy. It will be challenging. And the situation, for sure will be worse. We are also working with that particular 
uh, young young men and, and, and women um, that that comes in in a also particular situation uh, if especially if they have been linked here in in the United States with some gangs of some criminal activities. First of all, we have to, to enhance our job a, a, in exchange information about them and try to, a, to get a, the better experience of a, the, the, the common skills that each, a, our team has. For example, in our case, we have been focusing on working with the with the counties in in the United States that have more challenges with gangs of with, with criminalities, we are developing with our police and uh, and with our uh, armed force a a job a, a joint work in in Maryland in Long Island the places where are more people that is related to those to those criminal activities. And we have been developing plans, and if the, if the situation <coughs> is that we return, we have also special programs to interact with them and to give them some support. Some of them are going to be in prison because maybe they have something pending there. But in the case of kids that have been uh, that have been here for a long time and that they return, we have a, a special programs. But as I, as my colleague Ambassador Tabora said, it's a really challenge for us. It's not a difficult, it's not an easy issue and really put pressures on our institutions. I, I just want to add sure. something, sure, I'm sure. sorry, but that is important to, to link with this situation. Uh, in terms of security, or uh, we need to continue fighting against drug cartels. Why? Because it's the main source of resources for the operations of the guns and maras, as we call. Because uh, unfortunately, uh, when the people return to our country, especially the people that have been related with this organization, the, the, this criminal organization here in the United States, so they are in charge of distributing the cocaine or any other illegal uh, substance in, in our countries. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk yesterday with the, the new uh, president of Colombia, a former colleague at the IDV at, at, at the university, about the importance of working together and trying to eradicate the increasing amount of cocaine produ that is producing in Colombia. That's an important component, and ha in the United States has to be aware of that situation. And we need to work together in line and trying to strengthen one more time the relationship between um, the Central American region as a whole, uh, Colombia, and also Mexico. I think that, uh, after the election in Mexico in two weeks, we need to start uh, the conversation as soon as possible, because we need to address the issue from a, a regional uh, perspective. If not, we'll be in trouble. Um, we have been how the, uh, for example, in 2011, 2010, uh, most uh, of the drug across over the Caribbean, and then they shift to the Pacific, and now we are facing the problem in the Pacific, but we recently uh, have observed, have observed how the, they are shifting one more time to the, to the Atlantic. So we need to continue working on that. It's the only way how we can prevent the domestic violence because uh, in, our, in our case, approximately between the 75 to 80 percent of the violence is directly related with the uh, drugs uh, businesses in, in, in Honduras. And the, the consumption is here. The consumption is here, and, and it's, uh, uh, that's the reason why this is a, char a share uh, responsibility. Sorry, for, uh, just to share again, 
uh, with you, you know, with the Ambassador Tabora and with other colleagues, we have been in, in Miami, in Jives, in the South Come. And over there, the, the authorities of the South Come show us a presentation. And they show our countries as their partners. We, as El Salvador, are the second partner of the United States in the seizures of drugs in the, in the, the Pacific. Pacific Sea. Mm -hmm. Only Panama is the one who make more seizures than El Salvador because they have both seas. So I, I just want to, to, to highlight this because always is to try to criminalize our people and all your people, and the gang, and the MS-13, but uh, we don't highlight the efforts that we made, mm -hmm. considering that we are not consumers, and that we are not producers, mm -hmm. because our land is not just to, 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 to make those crops. <laughs> it's not for that. And uh, the, the consumption of drugs it's not a, a, an issue of public health in our countries. Uh, so we are just in the middle of the, of the transit. So that's why I think that we have to, to continue working on this. Um, <clears throat> there's one question that sort of comes from a variety of the, uh, uh, the, the audience. Um, and I'll summarize it basically which basically is given everything that you've said in terms of the impact of potential deportations on a variety of your efforts to increase security, economic growth, et cetera, in your countries, um, and the, the loss to the United States of the people who are here. Um, is the, the answer something that either executive decision to reverse the, the TPS or legislative actions that would lead towards citizenship for those who have demonstrated over 20 years that they, in fact, uh, abide by the law, contribute to this country, and whose children, obviously, are American citizens? And is that ultimately the only answer? <laughs> Go ahead. You know, even if the, 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 we know that the Congress can fix a solution, there are former initiatives that has been in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, our countries had the experience with the law, the Nakara's law, with many of our citizens from our countries, from our region, it got the, the citizenship. Mm -hmm. That would be the, the greatest scenario for, for us. But even though they are, there are others, um, avenues that we can reach. And, and we have been given advisory to our people to try to get the citizenship through the couples, I mean, the, the husbands or the wives uh, that are citizens, or some of the kids are now 21 years old, so mm -hmm. they can get the citizenship. There are also some companies that are working that are working in this and trying to give, uh, I mean, maybe not the citizenship, but uh, a permanent residence for our people. So there are some avenues that we can uh, reach to. Uh, just quick in addition, uh, something that we have found as a consequence of the TPS cancellation is that a lot of people is able to get a different permanent status but they were very uh, on a comfort, comfort zone for almost two decades, just applying to, for the renewal of the TPS. Now, I think in the case of particular of Honduras, approximately more than 4,000 people, uh, they have found a different way to, to, to get a, a permanent status here. That's good, but um, as Ambassador Kahura mentioned, I think okay, we have to explore any possibility Obviously, uh, trying to get the citizenship is, is important. Mm -hmm. In the case of Honduras, uh, our people uh, is, able, is able to have a dual uh, citizenship, and, and that's an important and component. But uh, 
as I have mentioned to the people at the Department of State, but also at, at the Congress and the Senate, there are key questions that our people have at this time that are important. For example, what will happen in the case that they are forced to return, in our case, in, our, in your case, mm -hmm. November yes, 2019, in our case, January 2020, if they will be able, for example, to return to the United States under a B1 or B2 visa. So that's an important question because, for example, some of them, as Mr. Ambassador, what's going to happen with my house, for example, if I decided to return to Honduras, but after that, I will not be able to come back to United States as a B1 or B2 holder. Or what is going to happen with my savings accounts or with my money that is in US banks. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the kind of, of things that the people is thinking and is, is, try, is struggling trying to, to find out the, the right uh, answers. And unfortunately, at this time, most of that question Mm -hmm. have, no have no clear answer, but, and that's important. Uh, we have been working with DHS at different levels, and I think it's important, especially at the Congress level also to, as well, to, to, to continue working to address these important issues for our people. I should just note that the, the dates are important. That is, that the actual date at which these individuals are liable to be deported <clears throat> in the case of November 2019, September, September 2019 for uh, Salvadorans and January 2020, January 2020, 2020 that legislation between now and then uh, could directly result in either the extension TPS or the finding some remedy that would provide for additional uh, permanent status here that would avoid their deportation. And avoid, I, I continue to go back to it, avoid the parents being faced with the threat of either dividing their families <laughs> or taking their children back to situations where there's no guarantee of safety. And, and that's the reason why the flow of remittances to our country, I don't know the case of Salvador, but the case of yes. Honduras has increased significantly since last year. There was a stable, steady pattern during the last decade and during the last year, especially 2017 and now 2018, the flow of remittances has increased significantly because of the uncertainty about the future of, of the money of our people here in the United States. There's one other point which <coughs> goes to the question somebody specifically asked it, noting that when I put up on the, on the screen, the excerpt from the, uh, actually was from the legislation that was cited relating to the initial, that it related to the initial TPS designations and the conditions that were required for that initial designation, that it didn't relate to the termination. Mm -hmm. In fact, the termination in the law provides that if those conditions are not met after the 18 month review, then TPS is terminated. The point is that those conditions don't relate to the original fact of whether they were as a result of an earthquake or a hurricane or the Central yeah. American conflict. If the conditions still exist, TPS should be extended, which is what every administration decided up until at, as late as 2016, until this year. And the point is, is that those conditions, if those conditions cannot be met, then TPS should have been extended. And that might be something, and by the way, having talked to the people who wrote the legislation in 1990, 1989 and 1990, their intent was that it be temporary except if the conditions still were not met, then TPS should be extended. There, the other question which is, continues to be asked is, are there, what would be the capability to handle the integration, particularly into the education system, of the, these uh, U.S. citizen children uh, who only speak, most of whom speak English. 
-hmm. We are <laughs> developing plans. Our, minister, uh, our Ministry of Education is developing plan, plans in, in giving to our uh, teachers skills to, to, to get the English language because I don't know if, if you uh, knew the, this reality, but in our country, not everybody speaks English. You can see, uh, uh, you know that's our case. I've studied English for all my life in my country, you know, but it's, it's, not, on, it's, it's not the same. You got to get the skill in a speaking, uh, in an English speak, uh, speaking language to get the perfect uh, language. And our people don't have the skill. So we are beginning teaching the teachers the language so that they can be prepared in case that our kids return to our country and need a, a, an education in English. Obviously, we're talking about young people or, or kids that get a, for a, a different language in, a, in an easy way. But it's, we are focused on that. We are just trying to prepare in that. I just want to, to tell you it's not an easy issue because that's just one part of all the, the situation. But we want also to, to show the, the people of our country that we are trying to do our best and that we are trying to, to get integrate solutions, long-term solution at least, because I think that in the, in the field of the education, you know, you don't get the, the results in, in a short time. But in the case that our people is prepared time by time, we can have better results. You know, one of the other, uh, there are a series of, of questions that relate to um, the impact that this would have on the Alliance for Prosperity and the, the efforts that your countries are making to deal with the, the challenges, which are, relate again to, as well, to the U.S. government strategy for Central America. So wh what's your sense of the, what the impact would be if, in fact, on those dates, 195,000 Salvadorans were returned, along with the 170,000 children, and uh, the same in, in Honduras? Uh, as I mentioned, earlier, I believe um, that almost 90% of the people will stay here, somehow. Illegally. <laughs> Illegally. And the other 10%, perhaps, some of them will return, some of them <laughs> will go to another country. Mm -hmm. not to Honduras. That's a reality for different reasons. You know, and um, we are working in, in three areas that is important you to be aware. The first one is having a high level dialogue here in Washington, trying to find out the solution. This is a top priority for uh, the government, for President Hernandez and the, for the First Lady too. Uh, this is one component, um, and we will continue working with uh, our colleagues from El Salvador, from uh, Haiti, and other countries that are involved in, in this situation. The second one is trying to support uh, our people here, try providing advice or legal services, but also um, uh, documentation. That's an important issue in this process. Some of them, or most of them, uh, they don't have a uh, passport or any ID or something. We are working on that. Uh, we are in the process to open uh, three more uh, general consulates here in the United States and one special center in, in, Tucson, in, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, especially for, for the migrants. And, uh, and this is the, the second component. And the third component uh, is we are working in Honduras trying to improve the security and create more jobs opportunity of some kind of 
programs for youth and, mm -hmm. and for the kids, but also for the people that is uh, thinking to, to return. And, and the elderly people is, is, for example, they are pretty concerned mm -hmm. because they here, most of them have some kind of opportunity. And unfortunately, in our countries, when you reach the 40s or the 50s, is very difficult to get a job. And that's the other concern of some part of, of, of the population. So uh, one more time, we need to work in a more comprehensive approach. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's a huge challenge for the whole region. And, and probably um, if they are forced to return to the country in, 19, in 2019 or 2020, for sure will be a problem that eventually will come back to the United States. And I, that, I'm not sure in, in That last point is, is something which I don't think there's been much discussion, which is that the, the impact of deporting this number of people to these countries is likely to very quickly result in a new wave of illegal migration yes. north. Mm -hmm. And you know, for example, our TPS holders and all the TPS holders are people that have been living here in our case for 20 years or more, and they made their registration, you know, because they, are, they have the, the screening each 18 months. So the government of the United States know where they live, uh, they know where they work, they know about their children that they have, you know you have all the registration. And in that case that you just mentioned, that they just return and in the, because uh, of the stress that we can put in our countries, we can create a new flows of migration, we're going to have, again, people that comes here in an irregular uh, way that you don't have information who they are. Mm -hmm. So you have to begin with them the, you know, all those uh, complicated processes so that you, we think that it's a better idea <laughs> yeah. to extend the, 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 the temporary protective status. In, in the case of the Hondurans, for example, one interesting question was, Mr. Ambassador, if the TPS concludes on January the 6th on 2020, what is going to happen with our kids that started the school year mm -hmm. in September the year before, for example? Or because of this situation, uh, they unfortunately will not attend the school during the last six months because they don't know what is going to happen once the date comes through. <laughs> that, that's a reality. That's the kind of questions, the difficult questions that we are dealing with at this, at this time. And unfortunately, we don't have a good answer. Mm -hmm. And we need one more time work together and trying to address the main concerns of our people because uh, this situation is creating more uncertainty, uh, a resentment uh, to the U.S., especially in our countries, and that's not good. Mm -hmm. We are a good partner of the United States. We have a strong partnership, and I think we need to address the issue for a comprehensive. Okay. Even if anything happened, we uh, as country want to, to highlight that we are working to receive our people. I mean, we are working to create better conditions in our country. That's really a duty. We are engaged with that. We are trying to to develop comprehensive programs so that our people, if our people decide to return, they can just integrate in our society. Obviously, as we have been talking, it's not an easy issue. And you know, when you just uh, think on involving the best of your resources, the best of your, 
your time and on your cooperation in that uh, it's really a challenge from from our countries considering all the needs that we have in other uh, fields but we are committed with that but uh, the decision it's not a, a only for the government our people also take decisions and the majority of the time we don't participate mm. in those decisions. For example, what just Ambassador said, if they decide to remain here, even in an undocumented conditions, well, that's the decision. But even that they remain here in that condition, we have to be with them. We have to protect them and to defend them. Mm -hmm. If they return, we are we are there, but we have uh, uh, to contribute to create conditions there. And, and here, I think that the United States has to know what can happen. The people will remain here. Let me tell you just a secret. <laughs> In my case, uh, I mean, uh, I just know one story of a person, of a TPS holder, who has told me that he We'll come back. We'll, we'll come back to our country, that we return to our country. And I said, no, you know, when the TPS okay. ends, I will return to my country. I will just get retired. I have some savings, uh, savings and I'm, I'm going to, to, to look over there in, we, in, in what can I work. But I'm leaving. I don't want to complain and to, no, I'm leaving. But it's just one person, one Salvador, that, tell, that have told me that he wants to return. I don't know other stories. Maybe there are, but I, I don't know. So the majority of our people are not considering on coming back to our country. You know, just, just one quick comment, because I think yeah. that we are running out of time. Yeah, one last question. In order to create, <laughs> more and better opportunities for our people, we need a stability, political stability. And that's important that the United States be aware of that situation. For example, in our case, we are concerned about, about what is happening in Nicaragua. Because you don't know what is going to happen. Finger crossed that everything will be resolved uh, in the next days, but it could be the possibility that people from Nicaragua decided to migrate to Honduras, for example. Mm -hmm. That happened in the 80s. That's a fact. Yeah. So <laughs> we need to promote um, good governance, political stability in the region, and that's an important component to create more and better opportunities to attract investments. To, to promote the private sector that is the engine of the economy, uh, to create more and more jobs. And as, as Ambassador Conjura uh, mentioned, it's the only way how the people will feel that uh, there are the conditions uh, in our country to return and, and, and make that, de that decision that is not easy, especially after two decades living here in the United States. I think maybe we'll just end it there and I should say that the last question related directly to the question of political stability that whether the deportation of the numbers of Salvadorans and Hondurans uh, would affect political stability uh, in a variety of ways uh, in in your countries and that was the, the, the specific concern I'll also add people may not know that in addition to the three ambassadors from the three countries saying that they felt it would be a negative impact on stability in their countries, um, that uh, Southcom also had the view that it would have a negative impact on stability. Yes, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank our guests. I didn't know that. <laughs>